Amen. You may be seated. That song goes very well with the idea of boasting only about Jesus. Just a couple of other program notes. I understand that last week's message did not get put onto Facebook as of yet. Uh, I've been assured that they think they will be able to do that today. So I would encourage you to share last week's message as well. That was an evangelistic message last week. Now today, we're going to talk about some more practical things. I, in fact, I think I'm going to uh, start off with a little bit of a disclaimer because talking about the topic that I am talking about, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that there is a problem here in our body. There is no problem of this nature that I am aware of. But by the time I'm done preaching, I think you'll see that we all have to be aware that this is a problem that can exist and can come about at any time in our private lives, our families, our marriages, our relationships. I'm going to be talking about the title of my message today is Tongues of Fire. Tongues a Fire. I'm not speaking about Pentecost. I'm not talking about when the Holy Ghost descended and the tongues of flames were upon their heads and they're speaking in other languages. The human tongue has been called the strongest muscle in the human body. Is that true? Actually, no. That's a myth. Many of the larger muscles in the arms and the legs and the hips certainly have much more brute force. The muscles that are short, like the muscles in your jaw, the masseter muscles, can exert much more pounds per square inch of, of raw strength. But I believe it has gotten that name as the strongest muscle in the body, or that misnomer, because of the damage that it can do. The human tongue is an amazing a conglomeration of eight different muscles. Those eight muscles hook on in various places, some to the soft palate, some even to the base of the skull, others to a little horseshoe-type bone you can feel in your throat, and I know all of you are going to want to do it now. You can actually grab the hyoid bone and wiggle it, and there's attachment for the tongue there as well. These separate muscles all intertwine with each other to allow the tongue to do a wide variety of contortions and movements. Some individuals can even roll up their tongue and know I will not demonstrate it for you now, but I can. And I've been told that that tends to be hereditary and that some people can and some cannot. The structure of the tongue is very similar to an elephant's trunk or to an octopus's tentacle. But as small as it is, it may be that compared to the rest of your body, the human tongue can cause the most tremendous damage, pain, and suffering in your life and to those around you. It also needs to be noted that when I speak today about the tongue, I'm speaking about words in all forms. It could be the written word. It could be what you're putting out on Twitter and Facebook, any social media. It can even be sometimes hand gestures that are speaking words, aren't they? So when I speak today about this, I'm speaking about the communication, really. What we communicate, these things, whether it be on a blog or on social media, can set your world afire. In James chapter 3 is where we'll find our text today. That's where I'm focusing, and we're only going to use probably about eight verses of, of that book today. So James chapter 3, I'm going to begin with just reading the first two verses. James writes, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man. He is able to keep his whole body in check. James is actually giving his own disclaimer in those first two verses, isn't he? He's saying, even I. He said, because all. All means everyone. Everyone can be at fault at times in what he says. He says, if you've forever been able to control your tongue, all the words that come out of your mouth, everything you've ever written, anything that you've conveyed by communication, if you've never offended, never hurt, never said anything wrong or done anything wrong in that way, you are a perfect person. And he says, there is no such person other than Jesus Christ. How about that first caution there about wanting to be or presuming to be teachers? 
he says that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Many people want to teach for various reasons. Maybe they actually have a calling. Maybe that's just the way they're put together to be perhaps a school teacher or a professor or perhaps to be in a Sunday school or a pastor. Some people actually have that calling. In some callings, it's quite profound. Some people have actually had quite profound calling of God upon their life. But then there are those that want to be teachers. They want to be today, maybe we should use a word that's more common to the young people, that they would know it's called being an influencer. Many of you know what those are? That's these people that want to be on Facebook and YouTube everywhere. They want people to come and, and click on and like them and to see what they have to say. And then they get advertising dollars. Some people actually become rich by being an influencer and they also become well known. And many people want notoriety. They want fame. James says, be cautious. Be cautious because if you are an influencer, if you are one who speaks, you are also going to have greater accountability. You're going to be judged more strictly. This isn't to dissuade you from taking those roles if you really have a calling, if that's what you feel inclined to do, but it's cautioning us that we need to be sober. We need to be serious and not take lightly. Greater responsibility results in greater accountability, to be sure. Even though James had been in that position as a teacher, a preacher, he says, even I, because all, have stumbled and fallen. This should be a warning to all of us as we begin this chapter, to remain humble, not thinking more highly of ourselves than what we should. Also, caution is inferred to us that we should not place a teacher or a preacher on a pedestal because they're just human as well. If you expect them to be perfect, you will be sorely disappointed. And many people have had their own faith shaken to the core when they find that someone they've really respected and looked up to has stumbled and fallen. And it might be in the way they live, but it also could be in the words that they say. Maybe they say something you don't agree with. There's all kinds of things that can come to play to cause someone to fall off of that pedestal. He goes on in James 3, and I'm going to read verses 3 through 6. He gives some really good illustrations here, illustrations that can be understood and perceived by the people of that time, but even today. He says in verse 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and they're driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. There's that word boast again. Remember in the communion table this morning, I talked about Paul said, I boast only in the cross of Christ. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body, it corrupts. The whole person sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire of hell or by hell. The book of James is known for its straightforward advice. Much like the book of Proverbs, when I first became a Christian as a young teen and I was reading from this book, I, I liked this book because it was straightforward, easy to understand, and it was easy to take a chapter like this and apply it to that teenage life, life uh, circumstances that we live in, in our school setting. Good advice, easy to understand practical statements. He talks about a bridle's bit. His listeners, and even today, we understand what a horse does when you put that bit, the bridle and the bit in his mouth. It gives you a lot of power to control the beast that's much larger than you. You can put a small child. We had a horse years ago that weighed probably 1,100 pounds, and we put our third grade daughter on that horse, and she could control that mammoth beast compared to her by that bridle and bit. He also uses the same type of analogy with the rudder. Small as it is, 
compared to a large ship. It controls both the direction and ultimately it controls the destination that you're going to arrive at. This past week, some of you may have heard a news story. It was on national news of a young woman. This young woman received quite a raise. She held up a paper and she showed it on Facebook and different social media. She'd received a $20,000 raise. That's a very large raise. She was boastful. She was bragging, look how great this is. And all was good and well until her employer saw it or caught wind of it. And he promptly or she promptly or corporate executives promptly fired her. She went from having a huge increase of wealth come into her life only to have it taken away by her boasting. This is what I mean by many forms in which we speak. She lost her job. The repercussions of her boasting, it was quick and costly. All of us can likely recall a time when you've said something that you've later regretted. You know, we've all had that your foot in the mouth moment. All of us have had those. Some of us have had many. I've had many myself. When you wished you wouldn't have said, sometimes it's innocent and just by mistake, where maybe you offended someone. Maybe you intended it, though, on purpose and later regretted it. Today, young people are repeatedly warned to carefully control and limit what they post because it's a permanent testament to whether you like it or not, and employers and other people will look at it as a testament to your overall character. You know, when I was a young boy, and, and I would just say right now, for some of you, you don't talk very much. Some of you, by nature, are just quiet. Good for you. You have such an advantage. You have such an advantage because those of us that speak much are in a lot more danger. You know, we're, we're wading into deep waters. And sometimes we can't help our personalities. As a young boy, I remember, you know, they used to, I don't know if they use this term today, but talk about parents telling you not to sass them, sass back, you know, talk back to them. Don't be sassy. Some of you name your pets sassy. I've heard of that. When I was a young boy, unfortunately, I had a quick tongue. But I want to tell you, my dear mother had a faster hand. I have teased my mother today. Some of you don't know maybe who Sugar Ray Leonard is, but he was known for the quick hands on the speed bag. And I've told my mother in these recent years, I say, you know, Mom, I think you could have gone a few rounds with Sugar Ray Leonard because that hand could fly out there faster, and some of you young people might think that's horrible. Well, this is a different age, a different era. They were taught, if the mouth's what offends you, that's where the mouth gets a punishment. And I got the back of the hand across the mouth many a time. It was good for me. It was good for me. I would rather get the hand of my parent teaching me to control my tongue rather than have to offend and wait for devastation that can come and have God have to chastise me for the way I've used my tongue to hurt someone. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 14 says, Wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. Wise men store up Knowledge. I couldn't help growing up on a farm thinking of this verse when it says, wise men store up knowledge. I couldn't help but think of when I was a, a teenager. We were working on the farm. Many of you know what a hopper wagon is, and we're offloading the, the grain off the combine, and the spout's just pouring the grain in. Well, on the other side of the combine was a chute, and there was a door that you cranked up, and usually it would just fall down as soon as you remove the latch after we'd emptied it. We'd bring an empty to get refilled to take to the bin, we had one that the door stuck. You could release the latch, and if you didn't pay attention, the door would stay up. I remember one day being in the field, and we were pouring the grain out of that spout, out of the auger, shooting into the yellow, uh, from that, into the wagon. And not too long afterwards, finding there's a good pile of grain on the opposite side of the wagon. It's running out as fast as it's coming in. Store up. You can't store up when the chute's open. 
It's difficult to store up knowledge when your mouth is open. It tends to leak out. Proverbs 10, 13 says, Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but the rod of punishment, or your mother's backhand, awaits the one who lacks judgment. No, that part about the mother's backhand wasn't in there. Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but the rod of punish or punishment awaits the one who lacks judgment. It is unfortunate, but it's true. How and what we communicate can lead to much suffering, whether it results in a lost job or lost friendships or even lost lives. For instance, some of us communicate with hand signals, don't we? Other people do it on the road and it leads to road rage and it can lead to all kinds of terrible accidents and even fights and death. The tongue can truly set your world afire. That's what James has compared it to in verse 6, a fire. Our words, our communication may be like a small spark that grows by leaps and bounds into a great fire and it causes massive suffering and damage and destruction. It's easy to imagine this scenario because we can turn on the TV and see the fires covering thousands of acres, especially in the west and the southwest. James is saying that the tongue is like the spark. It can cause the entire course of your life to change, but it also can affect a seemingly unlimited number of other people. See, when we speak, it isn't always just our own lives that are affected, it's the lives of those around us. In verse 6, James calls it a a world of evil among the parts of the body, and it can be used as a tool of hell itself to corrupt or to pollute the whole person. None of us live in isolation. None of us live in a bubble that does not affect others. I've hardly ever talked to someone on this subject, it didn't matter how old they are, because older adults often testify of how negative, hurtful, critical words that were spoken to them as a child by a parent, a teacher, or even by their peers have taken them years to overcome if they were able to do so at all. Words that were spoken in the heat of the moment, sometimes between a parent and a child. Words spoken in anger can really harm someone's self-esteem, but also the relationship between the parent and the child that can affect that child for years to come. Or how about the words spoken in anger between a husband and a wife? Now, I know none of you good people have ever had that happen. But I can confess that even I have experienced Problems with my tongue, saying things to that beautiful woman I've been married to for 48 years. It can cause trouble in relationships. Sometimes, I wonder how how many times, friendships have been lost due to one party or the other where a friend has violated a confidence by gossip or by a lack of loyalty. You know, by now, I'm sure that most all of you have thought of some time in your life when you've been the victim of such a thing. When you were harmed, or perhaps you think about a time when you are ashamed because you know you inflicted damage on someone else by the use of a sharp-edged tongue or words that were let out or something that was communicated that shouldn't have been. The admonition that we are often told or that we hear is to think before you speak, and it's a good admonition, isn't it? It's good for everyone. That statement is a practical application of the proverb we spoke of a moment ago or that we read about discerning lips. To discern means to consider carefully what you say. Discerning lips is also a mark of maturity. It's a mark of wisdom and control and restraint. In that same wonderful book of Proverbs, Chapter 12, verse 18, it says, Reckless words pierce like a sword. How many of you have ever had, no show of hands, a reckless word that was let out with quickness, impulsively, 
that has caused harm and hurt and you were so grieved by it, you were sorry that it happened. Reckless words, they pierce like a sword. They cause pain and suffering. And yes, sometimes those reckless words can even be deadly. Often in our fallen world, we encounter fake news, don't we? Any of you encountered any fake news this week? I'm sure you have. I'm sure I have. I speak to people, in fact, even this morning, someone told me how we can't trust what we hear. Well, fake news is not anything new. Oftentimes, fake news is used to wield power and control and to manipulate others to gain an upper hand. In warfare, they call it propaganda. Even our own government has used it. Some of you may have seen an interview by a former high-up official just in this past week or two. If I said his name, I think all of you would almost know him. But he admitted that he had used false words. He had used words to manipulate. He used propaganda to influence a coup to help overthrow a foreign leader, foreign governments. America is accused of it all the time, but we rarely ever admit to it. Here was someone that had the ability to do so, had done so, and actually said that he had done so. Using words to cause harm. Sometimes they do it on purpose. There's a true story from a book, and it's called The Fabulous Rogues. That's the name of the book, and it shows how devastatingly powerful words can be. The story starts in 1899. 1899, there were four reporters of four different newspapers in the city of Denver, Colorado. They got together and they were commiserating with one another how it was a slow news day there at the railroad station. They were hoping to see a celebrity or someone that was supposed to come in and they didn't show. They were all saying how disappointed they were and how they hated to go back to their editor's desk and tell them they had nothing to report. So they decided to go to a restaurant, and they sat around a table, and they began to concoct a story. Well, what if we just make up a story? What if we just made up some news and gave it to them? Wouldn't that be fun? So they decide, well, if we do this or we do that, a lot of different ideas, this can be too easily checked out. They decide, well, we need to make it about a foreign country. You've got to remember, this is before the automobile was widespread, you know, communication wasn't worldwide. Things moved very slow. They said, well, I don't know enough about Russia was one of the nations. They talked about other European nations, but it was decided because China had built a great wall and they were so isolated. Not very many people knew much about China. So they thought that would be the safe bet. So they concocted a story about the nation of China. And by the time they got it done, this is the gist of the story. These four reporters went to their four respective newspaper editors and said while they were at that train station, they ran into an American group of engineers who were traveling at the request of the leaders of China to come to China and to examine what they could do to tear down the Great Wall of China. Now, these leaders in China supposedly, according to the story, wanted to demolish the wall of China to show goodwill to the rest of the world, that they were now opening themselves up to international trade. They were going to remove an ancient boundary. Convincingly, they presented this story that they worked long into the evening, and they all submitted the same story to their editors, and it got published on an interior page, not front page. They thought, we got away with it. It's so funny. They thought it was quite funny until about two weeks later when they found out that a newspaper out east had picked up the story, put it on their front page. The story began to snowball and roll and gain momentum and things were added to it and embellished and made to become even more important. And then when the story finally, weeks and months later, came to the nation of China, this rumor about it made some of the people there who were already upset with their leaders, it made them revolt. And by June of 1900, the fake news story had sparked an uprising that resulted in missionaries and hundreds of foreigners of their converts being massacred, put to death. They attacked and put American and other countries' embassies under siege. So then 
these countries that had their embassies under siege and to rescue their people sent thousands of troops into China. And there were hundreds and even thousands likely that died due to what all came about by the spark of a lie that was concocted. Pain and suffering. By the way, that's known as the Boxer Rebellion. And you can look that up later today if you like. What the four reporters thought was something harmless. It was a spark that brought the death and destruction and it released hell itself, just like James talks about in that passage. In James chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he goes on and he writes this. He says, All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. All kinds of animals. He says, even in their day, people trained animals for entertainment, evidently. You know, we do that in this country. We even have TV shows. Anybody remember a talking horse? Or perhaps a pig named Arnold. Or perhaps you visited a place called SeaWorld and you've watched sea otters perform and you've watched dolphins do their stunts and tricks and even performing would be a killer whale. All kinds of animals can be trained James says, to do tricks and stunts, they can train them all, but no man, no one can tame the tongue. Is it any wonder that James started out telling you that no one is perfect? And he says, and if you are perfect, then you would never have a problem with your tongue, would you? If you're never at fault by what you say, you are perfect. But he says, recall that none of us are. We all stumble, James said. One of the things that teaches me is that when I realize that I can put my foot in my mouth, I can offend by words I said or something along that order, it reminds me that when you do it, I need to act with grace. When someone offends and hurts me, I need to remember how gracious God is to forgive me for my imperfection, for my sin. I think it is the tongue we joke. We, it's not a joke at all. It's something really true about the depravity of man that's within us. But the depravity of man so often is displayed by what comes out of the mouth. Since all of us struggle with this beast we call the tongue, with our words, we should all treat one another with grace and forgiveness. Like I said, some of you struggle more than others, but even if you think you can go into that area of your life and you have it totally under control, I would tell you that you need to remember what James says there in verse 8. He describes the tongue as a restless evil. A restless evil. Even if you think you've got your tongue under control, maybe you haven't done something to wound or hurt somebody or get yourself into trouble for a long time, you need to be ever diligent because the tongue is that restless beast, a restless evil. When I think of something restless, a restless beast, I couldn't help envision but envision a wild lion or a tiger in the cage just pacing back and forth, a predator that's there in its cage waiting and always at the ready for its keeper to unlock the door and just let it out. That's what the tongue is. The tongue is that thing that's there at the ready and it can cause tremendous damage if we let it out. Perhaps it's only with a measure of fear and respect for this beast and the fact that it can power, it has power to maim and injure and to destroy and to cause death, as we've seen earlier. Perhaps it's only the fear of those things that might cause the keeper, you and I, to act with all caution, all diligence to see that this beast is not turned loose. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15, Paul writes, God has called us to live in peace. You know, I talk about this sermon today. Sometimes pastors pick a topic because there's a problem with the congregation or the body he needs to address. I'm choosing today to be proactive. I know of no problem. I know of no conflict in our body. 
I'm being proactive today with this teaching to try to tell you to be ever diligent. Be aware of the words that can come out of our mouths that can cause harm. Paul said again that God has called us to live in peace. It's very difficult to live in peace with people who are wounding and hurting with their tongue or their mouth. It is easier to live at peace when the tongue is guided by restraint and wisdom. The book of James is a real treasure. It's a treasure of practical instructions, encouraging us to live godly lives. It's there to help us to live peaceful, productive lives that please God. Next week, I'm going to look and continue along on this small series that I'm doing on ways that we can use our words and our mouth to accomplish good things in God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for the blessings you give us of your word. Lord, I'm grateful to you that it is practical. Lord, it's inspirational. It's confrontational. It, it wounds me sometimes. It wounded me the day I got saved. It wounded me because I realized how lost I was and what a sinner I was. Father, today, if there's anyone who hasn't yet made that commitment, I pray that they would today choose to follow you. If that is you out there on Facebook or in this congregation, all you have to do is say, Lord, I'm convicted in my spirit that I need to follow you. I'm a sinner, Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and fellowship with me. Help me to be the person you want me to be. I want to make you Lord of my life. If that's your true desire, he will come in and he will save you. But in line with today's message, Father, I would just pray also that you would help each one of us. As we, some of us have been Christians for many, many years, and we're still growing, we're still learning, hopefully. Father, I pray that you'd also help us to be diligent about watching what we do. Whether the words that come out of our mouth are good for building relationships and friendships, or whether they're destroying or tearing one another down. Lord, I pray that you would protect this body and Christians across this land. I pray that we would always be a good example to those around us so that the unbeliever might see the love that we have for one another that is based on our love of Christ and that they might want to become a part of such a fellowship. Lord, I pray for strengthening today not just of this church but of every church in America and around the world. I pray, Father, that you'd fill the pulpits with pastors who are free to use their tongues to speak the truth of the word without fear of repercussions or restraint from someone sitting on a board who's worried about offending someone. I pray, Father, you'd help us to turn loose the word of God when it offends us in a proper way to show us where we sin and fall short of God. But help us, Lord, to be aware and show us where we need restraint in being kind and considerate and loving and showing grace to our fellow man and fellow woman. Lord, today I pray as we leave this place that you will be glorified. I pray, Father, that we would go to our homes, our communities, and be able to spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to use our mouths and our tongues for good things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.